Please help 10 people with elders and kids trapped in the second floor of the Catherine Building. This message, a post about political commentaries and pictures of cats, find its way on my news feed again and again. It's interesting in that our society with the social media age is reliant on a constant and overwhelming amount of information. We always need to be connected. You know, we have people who tweet and post about everything they're doing, wearing, saying, thinking, eating. We have developed highly advanced mechanisms to collect, store, and analyze data. And we use it to inform decisions about products, issues, political campaigns. We can take pride in the fact that our society, that our world, has restored relevance and value to individual voices. But the level of mobile technology or the advancement of mobile technology call us to not only believe in the power of voices, but to empower them ourselves. We can't be satisfied with just using crowdsourced information to have product reviews or get recommendations for movies. What if we allow ourselves to dream a little bigger? What if we use crowdsourcing technology to dramatically change the way we save lives in a natural disaster? No one can deny the tremendous strides mankind has been able to make with technology. We have discovered cures, explored planets, rebuilt cities, and revolutionized education. We also are able to gain a better awareness of the various struggles around us. We are able to communicate our hardships, to communicate our passions, our convictions, our struggles, and our pleas. Technology allows us to pursue our causes without being physically in the field, without having to feed the war-torn child or care for the victims of disease. Technology allows us to share in the missions of others within the bounds of our own capabilities and within the bounds of our own strengths. You can help a charity in Africa with their website. You can spread a video about a political campaign. You can take part in these processes without necessarily having to be in the field. Because value, at the end of the day, is not an inherent capacity. It's not in how many gigabytes something can hold or how many donations someone can send. Value is when capability meets need. In the wake of a natural disaster, the needs are varied and immense. It would be great if my technology would work. Okay, um, the needs are varied and immense. People scramble and try to find the resources because the traditional ways of communicating, traditional infrastructure is completely compromised. People rely on what they know. We've always sent relief goods there. We build shelters here. We send our rescue teams over there. But is that what is needed? Is that all we're capable of, given this technological age? See, I don't believe that. I believe that given the level of technological advancement and societal engagement in this world, ignorance is completely unacceptable. So thousands and thousands of people die in a natural disaster each and every year. Millions are left victim to homelessness, food shortages, and disease. Billions of dollars are lost, both during and after a disaster. Yet despite the frequency and gravity of natural calamities, many societies, both developing and developed, still suffer significant lapses in warning, relief distribution, and search and rescue operations. I have always been particularly interested in disaster relief because my beautiful home country of the Philippines is considered one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. In 2011 alone, the Philippines was hit by 33 natural disasters, 18 floods and landslides, 12 storms, two volcanic eruptions, and an earthquake. Pictures like this would pop up on, on my newsfeed months and months and would just keep on coming. I have pleas for relief aid in my email, and stories of devastation as well as heroism frequent the conversations in my social circles. I felt helpless sitting in the walls of the World Bank, or here at the College of Will and Mary, as my friends, my family, my fellow Filipinos were braving the storms and their aftermaths again and again. Particularly frustrating 
was I can do very little to help. A 21-year-old a thousand miles away could do really nothing more than send a, send a check. But then I heard of the judge who took out his jet ski from his garage and went from city to city doing his own search and rescue operations. I heard of the 10,000 prisoners in the city jail who gave up their food rations to flood victims. I heard of the courageous and very young Muelmar Magallanes who left the safety of his home 30 times because he knew how to swim and he knew others in his village didn't. He saved 30 people, though ultimately sacrificing his own life. In all of these stories, people worked within their own capacities using the resources that they had. I felt ashamed that I, with the resources and education I had, could do nothing more than write a check. So, inspired by the work done by Patrick Meyer and Ushahidi in Haiti, I decided to come up with a centralized and integrated disaster management platform that would leverage the voices of the people. I wanted to call it LUNAS, which is Tagalog for help, first aid, or remedy. And this system has a couple of different competencies, and I'll go through them um, with you today. First of which is an emergency or a crisis map. And what this does is it takes information from text messages, from tweets, from Facebook posts. These are messages saying, please help, there's a fire, or I'm trapped under the building, I'm trapped on, on top of the rooftop, please help. It takes these messages that are scattered all throughout the internet, all throughout these SMS and text waves, and puts them on a centralized map as to better coordinate search and rescue operations. Not only that, Let's say a search and rescue operator will take 30 minutes to get somewhere. If this is online, someone down the street may be able to help, someone with the resources. You mobilize the community, you mobilize people of different capacities and engage actors that are not traditionally part of the disaster relief process. The second part of the system is a road status map. What happens in a disaster is people try to get somewhere, whether they're saving someone or providing relief, only to find that the road is blocked. They waste time, and that time is critical. That time is between, that judges between life and death. And what's even more dangerous is that because there's no centralized way to report it, another organization or group will attempt this going through the same road only to find the same problem. So what the system does, it allows you to report a road being down or a bridge being down. You can upload a photo, you can upload a video, a news link, what have you but also engage the locals, so locals can go on and say, I know an alternate route. This is another route you can take. You can take this alleyway. Again, engaging different people. The third part of the system is a donor portal. Now what happens in natural disasters is that millions of people want to provide aid, but they don't know what to give, where to give, who to give it to. So what this does, what part of this, this part of the system does in connecting with a local NGO we're able to partner with local businesses so that people are able, donors all over the world, are able to purchase goods directly from the local grocery store or the local department store. This not only cuts the time and resources that are spent going through customs, going through donation facilities and um, government distribution centers, you also provide a small boost to local businesses and are able to monitor what goods are going to where. So you can say, okay, you know, 500 people have donated water to Manila. Water's needed somewhere else. Water's not being sent over here. Manila needs clothes, let's buy them clothes. Technology allows us an information exchange that was never before possible. We are able to engage governments and donors. We're able to engage rescue teams, the victims themselves, relief organizations. My project is just one of many initiatives as more and more people are realizing the value and inf of the information in the crowd. The potential of crowdsourcing technology to completely revolutionize the way we do humanitarian, we do humanitarian relief. Because the data is already out there. It's in the crowd. We need to collect it, and we need to realize its value from the beginning. Imagine what we could accomplish if people knew before a storm hit where to give and get information, where to send their emergency relief text, where to send the locations of their shelters, where to go to provide need, provide do donations. Imagine how many more lives we could possibly save. See, this information exchange 
isn't a product. It's about facilitating different capacities and allowing those different capacities to bloom into a wider and larger range of possibilities. So that Tagalog speakers in Paris, mapping experts in India, donors in California, and the local farmer in Iloilo can all be part of the disaster management process. Mobile and crowdsourcing technology enables us to be connected, but we have to take it a step further. We have to mobilize the people all over, all over the world. We have to engage people on the ground, relying on their knowledge and the knowledge of those thousands and thousands of miles away. Because let's not forget, technology was never intended to replace human capacity. It was meant to facilitate it. Technology was intended to bridge the gap between what our minds can conceptualize and what physical limitations allow us. Technology, no matter how advanced it becomes, cannot hold a candle to the ingenuity and resiliency of the human spirit. In the wake of a natural disaster, I have seen the tremendous things people are capable of. Whether you're a judge on a bicycle, or judge on a jet ski, um, whether you're a judge on a jet ski, prisoners with only food rations, a student miles away, or a child who just learned how to swim, you have, cap you have capacities. You are aware of your capabilities as much as you are aware of your needs. Why aren't we engaging people in the first place? Why aren't we engaging the people on the ground? Are we too afraid to trust these methods? To step away and be courageous, to step away from the traditional methods of looking at disaster relief. We have to be, we have to think a little bigger than that. Because at the end of the day, let's not forget, the people on the ground, whether you're in a developing country or a developed country, these are the very people we're trying to save. And in doing so, we forward an inherent belief in their value. And it's time we start listening and investing in their voices as well. And I thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to mine. Thank you.